Oh, oh, my bad. Sorry about that. Hey, uh, I was just lost in my thoughts there for a second. Uh, I was wondering, I, I, I got lost in this. Uh, what if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it? We all know that, that riddle or that question, but did they ever give us the answer? Uh, I'm kind of wondering where the answer to that is. Uh, it would be nice if I could uh, figure, I don't know. I was just lost in my thoughts about how it's funny how that people can just drop a riddle, but I haven't uh, worked hard enough to find uh, the answer to that yet. Uh, there is a Buddhist cone, a Buddhist saying, uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping? And uh, like the tree thing, I, I know this, it's sort of a well-known thing, uh, but I was just thinking about it, sitting over here thinking about, uh, when, when are they going to drop the answer to that? Uh, I'm kind of, what have I done to not, not ever like, haha, funny joke, no, yeah, go ahead and tell me. Uh, why, why don't I have that one answered yet, or where do I need to look? So sorry about that. I was just uh, thinking about that a little bit. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. This is Preparing for Sunday, where you and I, through the sort of uh, technological advancements of our world, uh, prepare and look ahead, <coughs> excuse me, to the upcoming Sunday scripture text. This is for Sunday, February 4th, 2024. At St. Stephen, we'll observe this as Scout Sunday, which just means we'll have extra scouts. It's a routine Sunday, but we'll have some extra people in the room. Uh, the, the liturgical day for this, the liturgical designation, is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany, year B. Uh, this is the penultimate, or the next to last Sunday of the season of Epiphany. We're getting close now. Uh, starting to think a little bit more about the season of Lent, which will be the next season. But instead of racing ahead, we'll sit here in this penultimate, next to last Sunday of the season of Epiphany. The scripture text for this upcoming week, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I have the same uh, uh, first reading as I used last week. It is not the lectionary's uh, designated reading. I designated it myself and now set it there two weeks in a row, which means it, that's sort of a telltale sign that I'm going to sort of continue on themes that you've already heard, uh, because the text itself continues on a theme you've already heard. The, the gospel for this week, and again, if you're a pauser, get that pause button ready, go look this up, and then read it so that you uh, can sort of hear what we're about to think about. But the text is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Mark 1, 29 through 39. Um, the first reading from Ephesians is a reading that I inserted uh, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities as a sort of uh, entree into the theme of this. Uh, it's the same first reading for both weeks. I did that uh, and I saw that as fitting both weeks because to be honest Mark 1 29 through 39 this week's reading really kind of just cuts last week's reading off in a weird place. It's really the same idea uh, in, the, in a second week. It, it cuts off what really could have been just one story with two events happening. Uh, so here we are, we're still in the first chapter of Mark, and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, our faith here is something of a riddle. Who Jesus is is something of a riddle. We're really early in the story of Mark still, even though we've been in it since December. Uh, and, and our earliness in this story means that it, it's treating us like we don't really know fully who Jesus is or what he's about to do. It's a riddle, and uh, you know what it's going to play around with is uh, um, answers to riddles and if they ever really happen. All right. So, so the way we'll enter into what I'm talking about there is uh, we get this second movement. So, so Jesus and Mark uh, has been baptized, he's been, the skies have torn open, and, and he's been declared God's son, beloved, uh, you know, for the audience. We now know who Jesus is. He's called the disciples, and then he's walked off on into Capernaum, and at Capernaum, he's uh, in the Sabbath, last week, on the, in the synagogue on the Sabbath, uh, approached by a demon-possessed man and heals him, uh, and then this week, he, he's still the Sabbath, same day, uh, same story, two events. He leaves there and goes to Peter's mother-in-law's house in this week's reading, and then uh, um, you know uh, heals her fever there. Um, the first part of that I think is uh, you know people of faith uh, want to ask about these healings. Uh, uh, 
why why do we know people or why have we been in times of wanting healed i mean i still have this cold you can hear it uh, lingering with me and uh you know if god heals why not just heal you know um uh, you know, what, what, what does it matter that we get these stories of these sick or and or disturbed people and that Jesus uh, uh, heals them? Uh, to me, that is a, a riddle that we're returning to. It's not promising healings. It's telling you what a healing would look like and who it would come from when it does. It's not promising healings, you know. Not everybody in the stories are, are, are covered in this, uh, but but what it's sort of talking to you about is: uh, Would you know uh, the sound of a tree falling in the forest if you heard it? It's not trying to answer the riddles so much as uh, uh, help you enter into what the answer might look like when it comes. All right. So uh, here. What we get is, and again, this blends back into last week's reading a little bit, uh, where it talks about Jesus' authority twice. Remember, Jesus is just now being introduced to us as God's Son and what that would look like. And so the first part Mark wants to tell us is that it's authority, and that hits twice last week. I talked about that uh, in, in, in the Sermon Sunday, authority twice. Uh, and then Jesus gives us a promise. Uh, that promise is that he's come. Uh, and that it, it, his presence is the promise that, 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 that he's that God engaged God in our lives uh, that that you know the, the, the answer to the riddle isn't the answer it's that the riddle exists and that we have been given in Christ the ability to even sit and think in God's presence um, and then ultimately these stories are about restoration and and, and there's two pieces to, to restoration. Uh, we live in a medical, a biomedical era where it's big business and all of our lives revolve around biomedical things. Uh, so the story has that, where Jesus is healing biomedically. Uh, but it's more than this, too. It's more than biomedical. And so uh, when we say, what does this have to do with us? Where, why, where are the healings today? If God was so good, why, why are sick, good people sick? You know, any question like that, uh, um, we have to understand that this is really about uh, restoration. And it's a cultural restoration, not just a biomedical. It's about people who, as a whole, uh, existentially, spiritually, uh, maybe feel a yearning and a restoration of people back into confidence that God is uh, near, that we are God's people. You know, if the Old Testament is the story of Israel being claimed as God's people, the New Testament is the same story. What it looks like to be claimed as God's people. And we hear this and we cycle through the lectionary because we just need to return back to the riddle, not the answer, the riddle. The answer to that riddle of what's the sound of one hand clapping is the time you spend thinking about it. There isn't an answer, that, but, but that's the trick. Biomedical people want answers, and we want solutions, and we want medicines. Uh, uh, and so this is a different movement, and it's trying to put us into a different place mentally, spiritually, culturally. It's trying to save us. And uh, that's a lot of the work I'm going to try to do in the sermon this week. Uh, I'm going to try to come at why we need taken off of what we think will save us and set again back into the promise and the authority of who God is and how God saves us. We think we have the answer to the riddles. We just visit the doctor and do better with that and then, uh, you know, it'll all work out. Uh, in reality, uh, the doctor's visits will come to an end for us uh, because sooner or later something that happens to us won't be able to be bi biomedically fixed. Uh, so. So uh, that's, that's sort of the um, I don't know, uh, context or the struggle uh, that you'll get inside of this text. One of the specific things to look at in Mark 1, 29 through 39, is that the person that is healed, that the story, this story revolves around, is Peter's mother-in-law. The text openly tells us that this is Andrew and Simon's mother-in-law. Uh, <clears throat> One of the uh, 
newer, uh, more recent questions of, of, of the Bible, and of Mark asks why Peter's mother-in-law is not named. Why are we given her name? We're told Simon, Peter, and James and John. And we're told uh, the names of characters, uh, often in John or in, in Gospels, uh, where, where, where what Jesus is up to, uh, we get their name. Uh, and, and one of the things has begun to ask, well, why don't we get Simon, if this is Peter's mother-in-law, why don't we get her name? And uh, uh, some people have taken that to be a, a critique of Scripture, not a critique of their faith. They're still faithful people. But they'll look at scripture and say, well, that she's not named uh, sort of points to an oversight of the text. Uh, it points to uh, uh, lifting up men and not necessarily women. And can there be restoration if you're not going to uh, identify women for who they are? Um, there, there's some of that going on here. Uh, and I don't want to belittle uh, that. Uh, that's why I'm addressing it. I don't want to belittle that perspective. Um, why aren't you know our mother-in-laws okay enough to be identified? Uh, aren't they worth it? Um, and wouldn't restoration mean giving her a name? Uh, and, and I don't want to belittle that. I want to say that, that, that the riddle here, in parsing out this piece of the riddle, uh, goes maybe deeper than that, and, and easy for me to say. Um, but I think the person is not named on purpose to make them sort of uh, more general so that it's, I think it's a narrative uh, uh, trick to sort of say Peter's mother-in-law. It connects to why they maybe went to Capernaum. It harkens back to Peter, James, and John's be, being present. It, it sort of emphasizes community. But by not naming her, uh, it, it also means that it could be anybody. You know, it could be any mother-in-law. When you give a specific name, you think of a specific character. When you reference a, a type of person, it, it, it makes you think of a whole type. And so I'm going to sort of stick with uh, maybe older tradition where uh, I'm okay with her not being named. I think it's valuable that she's a woman, and I don't want to belittle that, and I don't want to belittle the question of why, are, why is uh, a mother-in-law not named, but I'm, I'm not uh, going to stick on that too much with, 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 uh, with uh, considering this on Sunday. Uh, to me, the important parts here, and I may talk about this again when we gather for worship, uh, is that it's still the Sabbath. There's some parts inside of Mark 1, 29 through 39, where, we're, where the sun hasn't gone down. And Mark uh, is very concise. And anytime he tells us anything, there's a reason for it. He tells us the sun hasn't gone down to remind us it's still the Sabbath. Uh, which means that what Jesus does there, although nobody calls him out on it yet, is technically breaking the Sabbath rules because he's uh, healing and doing work. And so restoration knows no bounds. It's for types, it's for people. It wouldn't be restoration if it's if you have to follow all the rules first. It wouldn't be a riddle if you knew the answer first, right? Uh, if you know the answer and then go back and do the riddle, uh, it's not quite the same effect. And so uh, um, this is, is, is putting it onto the Sabbath uh, to try to talk about uh, how, how broken and how divided this woman is. She's not able to be at the synagogue. Jesus has to go to her. And so what she needs is restoration. Uh, only God, only God can come to us. Only God's authority can, can enact this restoration. And, uh, you know, that's part of what we get here. Um, this is a non-related woman. So for Jesus to come into personal contact with her on the, on the Sabbath, she's sick, and she's a woman who is not related to him. So he is breaking all sorts of norms and boundaries. And again, what, what the story is doing in a really concise, really quick way is showing us that she is a, a woman who is burdened, she's ill, she's therefore removed from her ability to participate, and so God wants to offer restoration. This is about God's salvation, and God's salvation here is a restorative work, um, and it's God's work, um, and that really is what this is about. And so on Sunday when we gather, what I'm going to try to do is, is talk about the ways in which we're all sick. And again, I just kind of preached about this, so you're going to feel like this is part two to last week's sermon in some ways. I'm going to try to diagnose some illness and then talk about what restoration would look like. 
And I'm doing that because I'm sitting right in this particular section of Mark chapter 1. And because I'm reading that in the way that I'm talking to you about in this prepared. All right? So last week, Jesus is approached by a nameless, possessed, scary, scary unclean, uh, possessed, unnatural, broken person. Uh, and this week, that's the same kind of thing Jesus comes in contact with. Last week it was a man, this week it was a woman. And this has to do with restoration and for things to be restored. And this is the part you don't like to hear and I don't like to hear. This is the part of the riddle we don't like. We know it's true, but we don't like it in reality. And here it comes. To be restored means uh, some, some outside of the, of the norm, some, some effort on Jesus' part. We don't like that. You and I don't like that because we like to think that we already know how Jesus works. And if we just pray harder, it'll work. We like to think that if we just, uh, um, you know, uh, do work out harder or, or, or tell people uh, how to vote better, that, that, that Jesus is going to come. And what this is talking about is that restoration is not possible in that way. And I wish people would hear this. Uh, I wish we would hear this in the culture that we live in, where we're all the time bashing our heads against, boy, that lady over there, my mother-in-law is terrible, she's sick. Uh, if she would just pray harder, uh, she wouldn't be sick. And we don't really say stuff like that, but we kind of think it, and then we kind of treat people like this. What this is saying is, is that for restoration to happen, it's crazy, it's boundary-breaking, and it's not what you expect. And so it's a brokenness of all of us before a thing we can't fix. And we're not just talking about biomedical things we can't fix, although that's part of it. It's also talking about sort of the spiritual uh, ramifications of what we can't fix. So uh, I believe that our bodies and our souls are utterly linked while we live on earth. They may not be for all of eternity, and, and God will know how that works. Uh, but, but for now, they are linked. When you stub your toe, it affects your spiritual life. And when your spiritual life affects uh, you know, how you approach sickness, they're not to be sliced up and separated. They're one thing. And so the restoration here that Jesus is working on is a story of his physical touch in a place that he's not supposed to be doing it, in the way that he's not supposed to be doing it, on a day he's not supposed to be doing it, to, 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 to show that you know that Jesus is there. How, you know, how do you know uh, if a tree makes a sound in the forest if you're not there to hear it? You know Jesus is there, that you know the answer because the restoration happens. And the restoration is not just, it can be, but it's not limited to, you took the aspirin and it worked. That's a miracle in and of itself, but that's not restoration. Restoration is also, it, you stopped, it, it isn't just telling people how to vote. But, but sitting together and, and still being a family when you don't know how to vote. When you, and both you know, sort of being uh, vulnerable. And, and, and when that is uh, brought to its conclusion by God, then you know restoration has happened. You know what restoration is. You know when Christ is present by how it sounds. You know, it has to sound humble and gentle and peaceful and but also that it does it, also that it actually happens. And, you know, the, the broken part of all this is that we're sitting with these riddles and we think it's us, if we just do better, we'll find the answer. Those riddles don't have an answer. They're not meant to have an answer. Uh, they're just meant to stop you from looking for the answer and give you a minute to sit in the riddle itself. And that's what this text is trying to do. It's trying to say, forget about defining the boundaries here to forget about what when where who what her name is just hear that God is a restoring God and that sets us down centers us back down into uh, belief the text here is very clear uh, what restoration is for and what it'll lead to because it wants to show you what restoration would look like when Jesus not just says it but does it and the word that it uses is diakonio, which is a word in preparing for Sundays that I have addressed before. Uh, it's a word that goes all the way back, especially to, uh, let's link it especially to Stephen, 
uh, Saint Stephen, who's in the story of Acts, that the church, our church, is named after. Uh, it's the word that we get deacon from, diaconio. Uh, deacon is, uh, in our church, in the ELCA, a person who's called to uh, the roster of the ELCA, a, a person who's designated, been seen as the church as a gifted person for this work, but they're called to, uh, if a pastor's called to word and sacrament, they're also often called to word and service, and it's a different kind of uh, uh, work. And that diaconio means service. And what this story looks like, <clears throat> excuse me, on one level, is that uh, Jesus walks in, doesn't name the mother-in-law, touches her, heals her, and it's and only heals her so that she can get back to work making sandwiches for the crew. And uh, I, 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 again, I acknowledge that reading. I acknowledge that the church has sometimes fallen into perpetuating, uh, you know, hey, let's fix this lady up so she can get back to work. Uh, instead of restoration, you know, that there's a difference between those two things. But the text here talks about being restored for diaconio, for service, for our calling. And this is to me a mutual thing. This is to me a community, community thing. Uh, I would say uh, one, of, one of the many things that divides us in 2024 is that some people think that uh, politics, our culture, our faith, our work is for ourselves, that, that we're working to be transformed individually. You know, like if I just pray hard enough, God will speak to me and I'll make a better salary. It's individual, it's about me. Uh, other people will think, oh, God, God's work comes through communities, that we're supposed to work together to make better laws, to make everybody feel better. And sometimes some of the gap we have is, is whether we're working individually or whether we're working corporately. I would say a, a sort of more progressive end is always trying to work corporately. And I would say a more conservative end is trying to always work individually. The scripture doesn't buy into that. And it doesn't divide things up. It speaks individually and corporately. This is the story of an individual healing of a woman. And uh, uh, that's, that's, you know, important. We had a story of a man, now we have a story of a woman. It's about restoration, but then it grounds itself in community. It's a, for the woman. It's for us. It's for the community. It's both. The healing is for me. The healing is for you. The restoration is for me and you. It's individual, but it's also communal. You can't be in service or live out your purpose, uh, you know, in, in the woods by yourself, uh, Googling whether a tree that fell in the woods made a sound. That's not the, the evidence of restoration. It's individual and corporate. And again, this is a false sort of thing that we make now. I want to go to church, we'll say, because I want to feel better. That's this individual thing. Or we'll say, we want to go to church because we're proud to be part of our church because they're doing so much. And that's a really heavy community uh, focus. When in reality, the healing is both, and the restoration is personal, it's God for me and for you, and it's corporate. God for you, for me, so that we interact and our restoration is wholeness, which can only be achieved communally, one piece at a time through each person. So that's a, so a lot of the sort of theology or the uh, nuts and bolts of, of, of this section of scripture. I have this uh, currently in the sermon, we'll see how, how we get when we get to Sunday, what this will look like. Uh, but it blows my mind that we've been in Mark now uh, since since December, uh, since right after Thanksgiving, and and we're not even we're, we're not even going to finish the first chapter this week. And we cut out part of the first chapter to save it for Lent. So uh, you know the nuts and bolts here are 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 uh, in these preparing for Sundays are are an example of just how much. Theology can be wrung from the sponge of even just the first few chapters of Mark. Uh, we, we've been restored by this text for centuries because it's just so rich. And that begins to provide evidence that this is God's word, that it can capture our imaginations and hold them this long. Uh, it starts to point towards something other than ourselves. That it's talking about restoration. A woman on the Sabbath who's sick that Jesus touches. All these are things that aren't really supposed to happen. 
that means that it's talking about being moved from where you are to being moved to another place. As another example of our culture, we live in a throwaway culture. I heard a little while ago uh, that we're filling up uh, landfills with clothes now. Uh, we have a clothes bin outside the church, and there are oftentimes it fills to overfill and float, and there's bags out on the ground because we just buy so much stuff. Um, and, and we live in a really disposable, oh, that's not in style anymore, or that doesn't work for me anymore, and, and I do this. And we feel good about looking good, so we, we, it's cheap, easy to get something else. Uh, this moves in the opposite direction. It's a text that isn't thrown away, that's kept. It's a story that we sit with that gives us a few different ideas. It should Peter's mother-in-law be named, or should she not? I'm not trying to give you the answer here. I'm not here to puzzle you. I'm not here to answer all this. I'm only here to be restored by God and to be restored by God individually, to believe that God restores you individually, and that too many separate restorations set next to each other are God's kingdom and God's restoration for uh, a whole community. I'm not here to try to answer it. Uh, in, in a few years, I'll be right back onto this text, and who knows what I'll be talking about then. It's not to get to the end. It's to be in the present and to be here with each other before God, to both say, hey, we're here, and we both want God's work in our lives. And in our lives. So all of that from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. In this, in this sermon this week, I'm going to try to do a little bit of uh, biblical teaching. I know people love that when I give it, so I'll try to do a little bit of that. But really what I'm going to try to do in this sermon is a thing I try to do most often, which is the experience of the restoration. The experience of it instead of just the explanation. And this text says that Jesus proclaiming in the synagogue uh, the explanation isn't the totality of the restoration that the restoration is in word and deed, and in what he does, and that that restoration needs to actually happen and not just be. So we're going to try to do that. Only God can bring that restoration, and we'll see if it happens or not. And if it doesn't, I'm not worried that we didn't get to the answer to the, to the uh, riddle. I'm excited that you and I continue to be called together to think about this and to wrestle with it together. That is the beauty of being saved and, and being who you are and who I am. So thank you for joining me today for our look at Mark. Um, I think next week we start to get out of the first chapter of Mark. Oh, wow. And then I think we go back into it for a minute, so don't get too excited. But anyway, we continue to slowly move our way through Mark, and uh, we'll do that throughout the year here. Uh, but this Sunday we're looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. And I have just worked through at least some of the nuts and bolts of it. Thanks for joining me. Stay safe, and I will see you soon.